Thank you, Martijn. Um, yeah, the motivation was, was actually twofold. It was not only the sunspot, but uh, this summer, there was a very interesting article by Carl Tape in the uh, Seismological Research Letters. And he proposed that we could use the portable array in Alaska. So that's the last segment of the US array. We could, we could use that array to track solar storms or rather auroras. And the two, the two are related, and the two are related through sunspots. Now, <clears throat> I don't claim to be an expert on sunspots. Uh, my education in, in astronomy was that it was the minor subject for my first degree in physics, but that was half a century ago. Um, then when I was a graduate student, my thesis was on the higher modes of surface waves. And that was at the same time that the astronomers started to observe surface waves on the sun, acoustic surface waves on the sun. And they could see many more higher modes than I could ever see. And uh, luck would have it that the astronomers in Utrecht were focusing on the sun. They, um, that, that department doesn't exist anymore, but it, it, it was concentrating on the sun. So I had a lot of communication with the astronomers in Holland at the time. And then when I was at Princeton <laughs> and uh, Hank Markering and Tony Dahlen and I developed um, uh, finite frequency tomography, this was immediately ad ad adopted by uh, Aaron Birch and other astronomers at Stanford. And uh, once again, I was talking a lot to, to uh, seismologists or to, to astronomers about seismology on the sun. So it has always been my interest, but um, this talk is not about things that I have done myself. This talk is just uh, something that I've been reading about and I thought I would share uh, my excitement about uh, what, I've, what I've been uh, reading about. So this talk, let me see, oops, yeah. The, and this talk uh, has, has four short segments. It's not going to be a very long talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll introduce you to sunspots and uh, I'll tell you why we should be interested in sunspots. And then uh, I will um, go to the two um, motivation for this talk. First of all, uh, I'll show you how uh, helio seismologists actually use our own methods uh, to predict sunspots. And uh, uh, lastly, I'll go back to Carl Tape's paper to observe solar storms with, with seismographs. So first of all, <laughs> most of you will probably know that the sun has an 11 year cycle. It's actually a 22 year cycle, but I'll show that in a minute. Uh, and so it goes through uh, periods of very high activity like five years ago or six years ago in April 2014 on the left of this picture, you see um, a uh, image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. That's a satellite that was um, launched about 10 years ago and that serves the helio seismology. Um, but this is, this is uh, a magnetogram. So you're, lo you're looking here at uh, a particular wavelength. I'm not sure exactly which one. Uh, of the chromosphere of, of the sun, which is the lowest layer of the sun's atmosphere. And you can see that there's a big difference between the left image taken six years ago and the right image taken one year ago when the sun was, sun's activity was at a minimum. So this cycle also shows in sunspots. <laughs> and this was an image taken just two weeks ago, photographed by, by an amateur. And um, the sun here, you, you, the, the sun will be, is rotating. So these sunspots that you see, they rotate from left to right. The rotation period of the sun is not constant. It's uh, about th three and a half weeks at the equator and it goes up to close to six weeks uh, near the poles. So these sunspots move from left to right. And they're numbered. So this one was numbered 83. Uh, 84 has died out in the, in the meantime, this was 85. But then the interesting one is this one, <clears throat> which was um, predicted to appear at, with the rotation of the sun to appear by the helio seismologists about a week before it actually appeared. <laughs> now, before I start to explain you how we did that, let's, let's look a little bit about what sunspots are. 
Uh, when the sun is at a minimum activity, you don't have any sunspots. When it is at a maximum activity, you can see sometimes 100 sunspots uh, or, or, or even more on the surface of the sun. And when you compare this to the magnetic activity of the sun, again, when the sun is uh, at a minimum of activity, the magnetic field lines of the sun look very much like a dipole. So it's very much like the Earth magnetic field. But if, when you go to the maximum five years or six years later, you can see that the magnetic field lines are now much more chaotic. And there are field lines that, that, that go out of the sun and come back into the sun. And this has a lot to do with the sunspots. The sunspots are clearly an activity uh, that shows the dynamics uh, going on in the convective layer of the sun. The sun, <coughs> the sun center uh, has energy transported by radiation, but then um, uh, closer to the surface, the, uh, there's the kind of sort of upper, what we call the upper mantle of the sun is, is the convecting layer. And what you see here is a time diagram. So the, I think the first year is 1877. The last year here is 1902. Um, here, oh, oops, sorry. On, uh, on the vertical axis, you see the latitude. And it plots all, this, all, the, all the sunspots observed at the time in what we call a butterfly diagram. And what you can see is that <coughs> when the, the activity period starts at, at the beginning of the cycle, the sunspots are at high latitude and they move towards the equator until we have the end of the cycle. Now, <coughs> the interesting thing is we, um, we, we can look at the splitting of um, the spectral lines of the sun and with the Zeeman effect we can then actually measure the magnetic field at the surface of the sun. And what you can see here is that in the, the front edge of the sunspot there's a positive um, polarization of the magnetic field and at the back side there's a negative polarization of the magnetic field at least in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere it's the other way around. Interestingly every odd circle and every even circle this pattern reverses itself so uh, the next cycle will have a black spot here and a white spot here. So that's why I say that the, the real period of the sun's dynamic behavior is 22 years rather than 11 years. But clearly these, these sunspots are related to the uh, internal dynamics of the sun. Here is this, this new sunspot that has just appeared. Uh, the size of this sunspot is about uh, four, four times the diameter of the Earth. So it's very, very big. And it's, it's the first big sunspot of the new cycle. The new cycle started a year ago. It's the 25th cycle since we started observing. Um, the um, sunspot numbers um, regularly. And this one is, is the first really big one to appear in this, in this new cycle. So why should we be interested in sunspots? Well, <clears throat> let's look at these, these observations. The observations are rather spotty in the 17th century. Those are these red crosses. And then they are uh, continuous um, since about 1750, and we start uh, numbering our sunspot sun cycles uh, in 1750. Now, uh, the sunspot number is sim simply the number of sunspots with some kind of formula um, that, is, that is visible uh, on any particular day. And what you can see is that, first of all, there is this uh, very big minimum in the um, 17th century, followed by a smaller minimum in the beginning of the 19th century and a maximum in the second half of the 20th century. So <coughs> clearly uh, the sun goes through a much more longer cycle of activity than just the, the 22 year cycle. Now that, that, that modern minimum here that you can see here where there are no sun, sunspots visible or hardly any sunspots visible uh, is, of, is of very interest, very much interest to climatologists. This is a painting by Hendrik van Averdonk in the 17th century in the Netherlands and what you can see is uh, that the population of <coughs> the Netherlands is actually uh, enjoying itself on rivers and lakes and uh, canals that were all solidly frozen. 
And uh, this is something that uh, continued until the 20th century. Um, Martijn and I are probably the only ones who know about this, but there is uh, a, a very famous skating race in the Netherlands called the Eleven Cities Race, or the Elfstedentocht, in the province of Friesland. This, uh, every five or six or seven years, in the, at least in the 20th century, um, the, the, the canals would freeze so much that you could, could make a circle along 11 cities in Friesland. And that was always used to uh, organize a big race. The, the champion, the, the guy who won this race, would be a, a national hero for at least a decade, uh, invited for uh, talks on television, etc., etc. But the thing was that uh, even though we had this 11 cities race, um, I think we have had it 14 or 15 times in the 20th century. The last was, was, was in 1997 and we haven't seen it since. So this is clearly um, a, a reflection of uh, the global warming that we are seeing. And so uh, one could ask ourselves, um, is this, this, this Mauda minimum that we have here um, <laughs> coincides with the small ice age? There was this Dalton minimum as well. Uh, how does that correlate with the climate? Well, here we, on the vertical axis here, we have the temperature anomaly reconstructed with uh, a kind of uh, probability density function because we uh, make a lot of errors in, in reconstructing that, but for about a thousand years. And when we look at the sunspot number here and the, the time when we, we see here the modern minimum at the sunspot number is correlated with a, uh, the small ice age, as we call it. It's a very small cold period. The Dalton minimum here is also correlated with a minimum in the temperature just a few years later. This is 1800 here. It starts just before 1800. This starts about at about 1800. So <laughs> there are all kinds of reasons to, to think that the sunspots, the number of sunspots or the activity of the sun is related to the climate. However, when you talk to climatologists, they say, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, George Philander, my colleague at, at Princeton once told me, he said, if that is true, then we can throw away all the numerical simulations for the climate because uh, numerical simulations for the climate do not show any influence of the, um, the uh, radiation of the sun on the climate or a very small influence. It might mean that um, our modeling of climate lacks an, an important feedback mechanism that we don't know about. But uh, so this is controversial. It's very controversial what the sunspot number has to do with the climate. The other reason that we should be interested in sunspot is that sunspots are not static phenomena. Um, they actually spew out um, uh, streams of uh, ionized gas, electrons and protons that follow the magnetic lines. Here you see one of those, those, those uh, eruptions. And um, it's, it's easy to see why that is. Because if we have a magnetic field line be here um, and we have a, a charged particle uh, moving, um, the component of the velocity in the direction of the magnetic field will not be influenced by the Lorentz force, but the component perpendicular to the magnetic field will be influenced by the Lorentz force. And as a result, the particle will actually circle around the magnetic field lines. And that's why they go up and then come down because the field lines return to the sun. Except when <clears throat> these kind of eruptions are so uh, violent, then the particle may actually exceed, the particle velocity may exceed the escape velocity uh, from the sun. The escape velocity of the sun is some 600 kilometers per second. <laughs> so that comes back then to how did we know that uh, there would be a sunspot because clearly these sunspots have to do with solar storms and solar storms might be a danger in the earth as, as we shall see in a minute. So the astronomers use um, uh, not seismometers on the sun's surface, um, but, but something equivalent to that, and it's called a charge coupled device. It's a little bit like what you have in your uh, iPhone as a camera, but it's uh, much more powerful than that. And it has 
uh, typically uh, 2,000 by 2,000 or even 4,000 by 4,000 uh, pixels. And these pixels can actually measure the Doppler effect at the surface of the sun. And that means that we have 2,000 by 2,000 or 4 million or even 16 million seismographs on the surface of the sun. So this is to make us uh, a little jealous, I think. So what can we do with that? Well, <coughs> here is an image um, of the velocity of the Earth. This is uh, positive is white and negative is black. So we can see it go up and down. Here, what we actually see here, uh, the fact that it's light here means that we are simply looking at the rotation of the sun. If we subtract that, we see the right image. And so here we have uh, a seismological image of the sun, about uh, 16 million, I think, uh, pixels uh, of the sun. And we can, we can look at them. And lo and behold, the astronomers uh, have looked at our own papers on how we are imaging uh, the rupture processes in earthquakes. And what they simply do is back projection, that we are a process that we are very familiar with. Their terminology is, is the terminology of, of the astronomers. They call this the pupil, which is mean they, they take this part of the, of the sun's surface, they trace it back, and they find that it focuses here. And uh, in the, in the, uh, they can do this over, over all of the sun's surface. And that means that they can actually see even if we are on this side of the sun, if there is a sunspot on the other side of the sun that is very active so that it is sending out acoustic waves through the sun's uh, body or over the sun's sur surface even, we can see them even if they are at the other side of the sun. And then by just calculating where they are, calculating the speed of rotation of the sun, we can predict when they will appear uh, in our uh, telescopes. So here's an example of how that works. <coughs> These are images of the sun's surface between um, October 7 and October 21, 2014. Uh, you have to look at this as uh, you would look at an earth map that is uh, always looking at the same part of, uh, of, the, of the earth. So say uh, zero longitude would be in the middle and we keep zero longitude in the middle. But since the Earth, is, uh, since the Sun is rotating, the back, the, the back side of the Earth, so the Sun rotates to the right, but since we keep the map constant, we will see that the back side of the Earth, which is this region here, which you see for example here, uh, is going left. So in October 7 it's here, October 12 it has moved to the left, October 17 has moved to the left, and here it's almost a full solar day uh, move to the left. And what you see here is that uh, this, is the, this is the backside. We cannot see this in a telescope. We can only see it with uh, our, our seismological uh, observatories. And what you see is that we have this, this, this uh, sunspot growing, 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 growing. And uh, here you see the point where it nears the limb of the sun. And it, uh, finally then it appears and it becomes visible to us uh, on Earth. So this is, this is uh, how this last sunspot was actually predicted six days before we uh, could see it. Another thing that uh, seismologists do is uh, solar tomography. And uh, here is a sunspot. Um, this part of the sunspot is shown at two different times. Uh, I think the difference is 18 hours or 16 hours. And you can see the activity. You can see this, is, this goes to a depth of uh, 40,000 kilometers. And you can see here it's, it's, it's relatively quiet. But a day later, uh, you can see that there's, there's a lot of activity um, in, in the tomographic, visible in the tomographic image. So this is, this is how we learn about what's happening in sunspots. It's actually uh, for those of you who, who like theory, it's very, very complicated because the, um, the, the speed of sound, what we are showing here is the speed of sound in the sun, but the speed of sound is a, a mix of the regular pressure driven speed of sound and the electromagnetic field because the, uh, here the uh, electromagnetic field is, is so strong that it actually influences also the, the motion of the, uh, of the gas. 
<coughs> now, what happens if we have a sunspot that ejects a, um, a stream of gas with more than the uh, escape velocity? Well, if, if that flare is in the direction of the Earth, it will arrive, uh, it, 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 it travels at a, at a speed of uh, 6 million kilometers per hour, and um, it will arrive in a few days, um, uh, a hit, and hit the um, magnetic field of the Earth. Again, then these charged particles by Lorentz law will follow the, the um, magnetic field lines, and they will mostly arrive near the poles. This is, this is why the magnetic field of the Earth is protecting us from the dangerous effects of, of this radiation. But the, the most beautiful effect near the poles is, of course, to see the aurora. Uh, the aurora has different colors depending on whether a particle ionizes a oxygen or a nitrogen atom or a molecule. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very different, very beautiful different colors. Um, I have been pleased to see uh, the aurora in Iceland. Uh, you don't see it move really, but um, if you wait a quarter of an hour, you see that it, it will have changed. The danger with this is that if there's a really once in a century event, it might actually um, induce currents, for example, in, in electric cables, and we get this artist's vision of white matter and what might happen at the next uh, Carrington event, as we call it, because the Carrington event was an event in the uh, 19th century that actually had these kind of, 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 of phenomena. So <clears throat> what, are, what are the space weather hazards, as we call it? Well, first of all, uh, the high frequency and satellite communication will be disrupted or even lost. Uh, we may see satellites um, destroyed. Uh, there were four Navy satellites in uh, 1989 that were destroyed. Um, NASA has calculated that if there is a repeat of this 1859 Carrington event, uh, potentially half of, of their satellites might uh, be damaged to make them useless. Um, GPS navigation will be disrupted. Uh, the last serious disruption in uh, WAAS, which is the navigation system for the airlines, uh, was in 2003. Uh, we may see power failures at, at the same time that these uh, satellites were failed. Uh, the, the whole of the uh, power grid in Quebec um, failed. And uh, one has, one has um, uh, calculated that potentially half of the whole uh, electricity grid in the United States is at risk. And uh, people in um, airplanes might actually be uh, subjected to uh, increased radiation levels. And so it's also a health hazard. Now, <coughs> the solar flares, we would like to know more about them. And <coughs> the problem is that there are very few uh, geomagnetic observatories. Uh, the, the geomagnetic observatories in uh, Alaska are shown here in circles, uh, orange one by the USGS, and um, then I think the Air Force has uh, the green ones, yes. <coughs> so Carl Tate wrote this very, very interesting paper in um, uh, Seismological Research Letters, in which he took the last phase of US array which is the, ten, the, the transportable array. And um, he realized that you could actually see the, electro, the perturbations in the electromagnetic field when a solar flare hits the Earth. <clears throat> uh, we knew that seismometers are sensitive to uh, magnetic field. Uh, it was Walter Zürn in Stuttgart who published this little um, seismogram uh, what you're seeing here, every cycle here is a day, so we're seeing here the tides. Uh, but on top of the tides, you can see this, this, this noise. And then you see that suddenly this noise stops to begin again three days later. And it turns out there was a strike of the, of the tramway uh, system in Stuttgart at this time. And so what we are seeing here uh, is the noise from the tramway electromagnetic field. Uh, what Carl Tate did was looking at the onset of a uh, um, 
coronal mass ejection observed uh, in uh, the Black Forest Observatory in Germany and in Fairbanks, Alaska. And what you can clearly see is uh, both of them see something that's an onset at the same time. So it's clear that this is not uh, an earthquake because these two observatories are very, far, very, very far away. <laughs> so um, since um, these observations in Germany in the 20th century, um, many, many uh, observatories have shielded their seismographs so that you cannot see them. You just put them in a Faraday cage of Faraday. But uh, this one in, in, in Station Kola actually uh, apparently still shows the uh, magnetic field. And what, what you can see here is um, an, uh, a comparison of the magnetic signal in blue and the seismic signal in brown. Uh, if there's an unshielded seismometer, you can see that uh, the two um, have, have some correlations here. Uh, if you shield the seismometer, uh, you don't see the magnetic uh, signal. But here, again, is the uh, magnetometer signal um, with three components, vertical, east, west, and north, south. So there is clearly uh, an, 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 a possibility to observe the magnetic field with seismometers if they are not shielded. And the uh, US array seismometers, because it was always a temporary uh, deployment that could not cost too much. Uh, people saved money by not shielding them and not putting them in a Faraday's cage. Here is uh, a photograph of an aurora taken at the same time as the observation on the seismograph. And you can see that, uh, yes, this is, this is a very nice uh, solar storm hitting the Earth uh, in um, February 2019. This was actually at the start of the um, of the 25th cycle. Um, here's another example. Uh, the black line here shows the time of when this photograph was taken. So, and this is an, an example in gray. We see the signal on the seismograph, and in the colored lines are the. Um, uh, spectral content of the Aurora camera. And so we see the, the three spectral lines, blue, red, and uh, green. Uh, certainly green, I'm not sure which one the green is, which is oxygen or nitrogen uh, that's being ionized. But um, it, there's, there's very clearly is a, a, co a clear correlation between the seismic signal and the Aurora activity. So, <laughs> That's, oops, that's where I leave you here. Um, I have two references. If you're interested, this is the, the paper by Carl Tape and Adam Ringler. Adam Ringler also wrote a paper in BSSA. Um, and if you're really interested in the sun, there is a, a beautiful um, website that uh, shows the solar dynamic observatory images in, in real time. Thank you very much.